I'm going to invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 3. We're going to be in verses 15 through 38. We're only going to read up to 22, but we will see all the way down to 38. And if you don't have a Bible with you today uh, and you would like to eventually have one, perhaps own one, uh, please let us know before you leave. We would love to be able to uh, gift you a Bible for you to take home with you. This morning, we find ourselves in a narrative where Luke describes for his audience, a man by the name of Theophilus, and by extension, he describes this to us today, the arrival of Jesus into the wilderness where John the Baptist has been ministering for around six months. And so John the Baptist has been ministering, baptizing people, and Jesus is now coming into that wilderness in order to be baptized by John. Now, we have learned as far back as chapter 1 that when the angel announced to Zechariah that his 70-year-old barren wife would have a child that she would name John, uh, this child would be the one who would prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. And that child, as we saw last week, is now a man, and he has been doing just what the angel announced that he would be doing. He is turning many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And in the spirit and the power of Elijah, he is turning the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the children to the father and the disobedience to the wisdom of the just, making ready for the Lord a people for himself. So my question to us is, how has John been doing this? And last week we saw this in chapter 3, in verse 3, it told us how he's been doing this, right? It told us that he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Now, this is a bit odd in that time, in that context, because first of all, baptism was in a Jewish custom. It was mainly used to proselytize Gentiles into the Jewish faith. In other words, if you were not a Jew and you were interested in the God of the Jews, then there was a ceremony of purification that included baptism. And the, and the wonderful thing about this is that John is proclaiming this baptism for repentance of sin, and he's proclaiming it to everybody, to everybody. In fact, he categorizes everybody as a sinner. He calls us all vipers. And this is how he, in the power of the Spirit, is preparing a people for the Lord. In other words, what is John doing? John is preparing a people for the Lord with a simple goal. And that simple goal is he is working to expose our sin. He is working to show us our condemnation. He, he is working to reveal to us the judgment of God. He is working to lead us towards repentance. And he does this through the prophetic avenue of confrontation. I don't know if you guys remember some of the uh, prophets of the Old Testament. They were, they were guys that would confront the people of God, right? They were used by God to confront his people. And they always brought a word, a word of warning or a word of judgment or a word of promise. They were men who spoke with authority. They were men who spoke with boldness. And it's been 400 years that God has been silent. 400 years since God has raised up another man that speaks like these men. And so very simply put, John is ministering in a time where God has been silent for 400 years. Where Roman domination is what's going on in that culture. Where Jewish exhortation is also going on in that, in that culture. So what we can say is that this is an extremely pagan culture, an ex extremely pagan government, and an extremely hypocritical church. It is suffice to say that the truth and the righteousness where John comes preaching repentance, you know, to that there is, there is no such thing, right? He's coming to a place where you have a bunch of pagans running the show and where you have a bunch of, of God's people being hypocrites to what God's called them to. And so he comes in the authority and boldness of the prophet Elijah preaching and confronting 
their sin. So last week, Jonathan uh, showed us this, right, that uh, John confronts our sinful nature. He calls us all vipers. Did you know you were a viper? You know, because John calls us all vipers. And so he confronts our sinful nature. He confronts our superficial motives. He says, who warned you to flee, right? In other words, your, your motives are simply self-centered motives. He confronts our shallow commitments. He says, don't just come and be baptized like a, some religious ritual. No, 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 no. Listen, I want you to bear fruits keeping with repentance. John confronts our shaky theology. Right? He says, don't you think that just because you're children of Abraham. In other words, don't go around saying you're children of Abraham. You know, he, he reminds us, listen, it's not, it's not your, this, who you're descendant of that makes you a child of God. Then he confronts our sorry discernment. He says this. He says, listen, I want you to know that the axe is ready right next to the roots of the tree. It's ready for judgment. It's ready for chopping down. You know, so John, John is doing this, and th this, is, this is how he is confronting his culture and calling them to repentance. And as we see John do this, uh, there, there arises a question in the hearts of the people. Right? They've never seen this prophetic voice. 400 years, God has been silent. All of a sudden, you have this prophet, you know, preaching repentance. And so that arises this question in the heart of the people. And that's the question we're going to see today. So what is that question? We'll go to chapter, uh, go, to, go to verse 15, chapter 3, verse 15. And here it is, God's word. Now the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I, I am, is coming. I'm not worthy to unite the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His win winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the shaft he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. But when John rebuked Herod, the tetrarch, because of his, because of Herod. Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the evil things he had done, Herod added this to everything else. He locked up John in prison. When all the people were, and many of the people that loved him, his friends, his colleagues in the seminary, they told him, hey, listen, don't go on this trip. You know, it's, it's a far trip. You're going to go by train. You got to, you know, probably uh, uh, at some points have to ride a horse or something like that to get to the place where he was going. It's cold, it's snowing, uh, you're sick, don't go. And uh, Machen, you know, he was just, uh, he was a man's man. He said, listen, I, I committed to going to preach these lectures there in North Dakota, so I will go. You know, if I commit it, I will go. Well, when he made it to North Dakota, he was so sick that he never made it back to Philadelphia. He died in North Dakota. But here's the reason why I'm, I'm telling you this story is because of the telegram that he sent his colleagues uh, back in Philadelphia. It was a very short telegram. But before he died, this is what he wrote to them. He said, grateful for the perfect active obedience of Christ. That was it. Here is a man away from home, away from his family, his friends, his colleagues. And in his dying words, he sends a telegram. And all that telegram says is grateful for the perfect active obedience of Christ. Beloved, this morning as we come to the narrative of Jesus' arrival into the wilderness to be baptized by John the Baptist, what Luke is displaying for us is the sufficiency of Christ's perfect active 
obedience. And perhaps some of you hear me say these words and you question in your minds, well, what is he talking about, right? What is active obedience? And so let me explain that really quick. Historically, uh, there's been a distinction between the passive obedience of Christ and the active obedience of Christ, okay? The passive obedience of Christ refers to his willingness to surrender to the Father's mandate that he would offer up himself as a sacrifice for the atonement for the sins of the people in the cross, See, Jesus did not resist his executioners, right? Jesus told him, you have no power over me, but I lay down my life for my sheep. It's an act, it's something, it's an action, but it's a passive action, right? It's a passive action. He surrenders his life in obedience to the Father. That is called passive obedience. He didn't kill himself, right? But he surrenders himself to his killers, and he is sacrificed. So the contrast to that is the active obedience of Christ. And the active obedience of Christ is Christ, you know, submitting himself to the perfect law of God and obeying that for 33 years. Now, this is important to have this, this, this contrast. This is important for us to understand. Because Christ's active obedience is directly related to our text about the baptism of Jesus. Because in this text, Luke wants to describe for us Jesus' disposition towards, number one, relating to the people. Number two, Obeying his father. And number three, fulfilling all righteousness for us. My brothers and sisters, so often we look at Jesus and we simply see a loving teacher. Or some people look at Jesus and they simply see a perfect model for life, right? Jesus is a good model to emulate. He's a good model to follow. You know, let's, let's be like Jesus, Oh, we see Jesus as a gracious minister who, for, who forgives us of sin, yet we still have a problem viewing him as sufficient for us before the Father. And one question I love asking those that sit with me in a counseling uh, session, whether it's a couple or whether it's a, a, a regular uh, one person, the one question that I always ask is, is God pleased with you? And the answer to that question is often led by much hesitation. And Luke has been telling us that John the Baptist is preparing the way for God's people to turn back to the Father. And so Jesus is the way to the Father. And today Luke will allow us to see that the, father's, the Father is highly pleased with his son Jesus. And if the Father is highly pleased with his son Jesus, this should lead all of us into a confident engagement of the Father, knowing that Jesus' perfect, active righteousness, his perfect, active obedience, is the basis of the pleasure of the Father on us. Beloved, last week, Pastor Jonathan showed us that one of the keys to revival of our hearts is to know that Jesus is sufficient. You see, repentance is not only acknowledging that we're vipers, right? Re repentance is not only acknowledging that we're bad, that we're sinners. Repentance is also receiving God's forgiveness, and it is also resting in Jesus. It is what, what, what the text told us last week. It is bearing the fruits of repentance. It is bearing the fruits of faith by finding Jesus to be sufficient enough to deal with our sins. He is sufficient enough to deal with our brokenness. He is sufficient enough to deal with our shame. He is sufficient enough to deal with our addictions. He is sufficient enough to deal with our weaknesses. 
So many give lip service and say Jesus is my savior, but never run to him to deal with the sin patterns that are destroying your marriage. You never run to him. You never run to him with the, with the sin patterns that are destroying your health. You never run to him with the sin patterns that are re destroying your heart and your relationships. You say Jesus is my savior, yet you stay away from drawing near to the Father. And you're afraid that the Father is annoyed by you. He's angry with you. You say Jesus is my savior, yet you are always trying to build your own righteousness. And in the process of building your own righteousness... You fail to grow in the love of God and in the love of man. And that's why you hurt everybody around you. Beloved, everything that I just mentioned is the fruit of a deep doubt that Jesus is sufficient. You know why you don't draw near to the Father? Because deep down in your heart, you don't believe that Jesus is sufficient. You know why you throw your hands up and you say, well, yeah, I'm a sinner. What can I do? Because you, do, you doubt that Jesus is sufficient. So here's our driving question for today. Why is Jesus sufficient? For sinners to receive salvation before a holy God. Why is Jesus sufficient for sinners to receive salvation before a holy God? Well, number one, there's two points today, all right? Not six, two points, a few sub-points. Point number one, this is why. Because he's fully God. He is fully God. See, John says in verse 16, John answered them, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. And so here we have John the Baptist. He started his ministry. Public ministry has been going on for about, you know, six months or so. And John walks out of the woods, out of the wilderness, preaching repentance. He's preparing the way for the coming of Jesus. And he was really good, man. He's a phenomenal preacher. He's a prophet of God. You know, he's the type of prophet that nobody has heard in 400 years. He's spirit-filled. He's bold. He's biblical. He's passionate. He's a preacher. And crowds are gathering and coming to him. Everybody wants to see John. Everybody's telling their friends about John. Everybody's saying, hey, Jonathan, man, you got to go see John. You know, he is, he's amazing, bro. You got to see this guy. This guy eats bugs and honey. You know, and he dresses up with camel hair. You know, so everybody's coming to see John. He's a big deal. People like him. And people start thinking, man, is he the one? Is he going to fix all our problems? Is he going to be our savior? See, people start wondering this. Is he the one that God spoke to Adam and Eve and said that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent? Is he that one? And I love the fact that Luke doesn't tell us that the people are asking this out loud. In fact, Luke tells us that they are asking this in their hearts. But John has enough discernment to know what they're thinking and he answers the question, the question of their hearts. And what does John say? John says this. I'm paraphrasing John, okay? This is Jose Prado's version of what John says. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. He is coming. And he is greater than me. In fact, he is so much greater than me that I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Now, we need to do a little cultural work there because, you know, if today 
I ask my wife to untie my shoes and take them off, she still might refuse. Not because she will do anything for me, but she does not like feet. Okay? But in this culture, listen to me, in this culture, uh, we're not talking about we're walking around with socks and nice shoes and, you know, nice little powders and, you know, and we have soap and we have these things. These people probably, some of them don't shower in days. You're walking in, in, in awful weather and you're walking in streets that are full of mud. They're full of, you know, animal excrement. They're full of urine. They're full of, like, you know, dust. People walk into your house with their sandals on, and probably from the knee down, their feet were disgusting. That's what we're talking about. And listen to me. It was the job of the lowliest of servants to untie the sandals of those who came into the house. In other words, not even, not even the pupils of, of like rabbis would untie their, their sandals. They would call the lowest slave, the least of the least, to come and untie their shoes and wash their feet. And John the Baptist, a prophet of God, a man who has, that was born with the Holy Spirit in him. The man that Jesus says, there is no man born of woman who is greater than John the Baptist. That man says that Jesus is so great that he is not worthy of doing the most lowliest of things, which is to untie his dirty sandals. Brothers and sisters, for a prophet like John, who is filled with the Spirit to say, I can't even untie his shoes because of how far greater he is than me, is a way for the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the divinity of Jesus. See, Jesus is not simply a man. He is God. And so how can we be, you know, how, how can we find Jesus to be sufficient for us to receive salvation? Well, he is God. And listen to me, only God can save. Only God can save. Luke shows us this. He says that this, this Jesus who is going to come and he's unworthy to tie, untie the straps of his sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And so what Luke is saying is like, listen, there is one that's coming uh, that it's much greater than I. In fact, I can't even do the lowest of things culturally that we have right? But this is what he's going to do with you. You see, I only baptize you with water. I sprinkle you, you know, I submerge you in the water. You know, I just have to say both for our Presbyterian brothers. You know, I, I do these things for you, but one is coming who is going to do something much greater. You know what he's going to do? He's going to baptize you, but he's going to do it with the Holy Spirit. Now, thanks to Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 27, we know exactly what John is referring to. Because that is where we find that promise, right, of God and how he is going to establish a new covenant. And in this new covenant, God is going to put his spirit inside of his people so that his people are able to obey him. So what John is talking about here is he's referring to salvation. Brothers and sisters, only God can save. Only God can regenerate a dead person. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. See, many people have this mentality of salvation as if God saw you drowning 
You're still alive. You're drowning. And he threw you this life vest for you to grab. But that's not really salvation. Salvation is really you're dead. You are drowned in the bottom of the ocean. You, you are completely dead. You're gone. And God comes in the power of his spirit. He comes into the depths of your deadness and he makes you alive and brings you up. That is salvation. And only God can do that. He is referring to God's spirit moving within a person and subsequently causing that person to walk in obedience. That is what salvation is. Now, I do want to explain really quick because some of us, especially those of us who grew up in Hispanic context uh, and our charismatic uh, brothers, you know, there is a movement of charismatics that would say that baptism of the Holy Spirit is the subsequent or uh, a secondary experience that happens after salvation. You've already received the Spirit, right? But then you are baptized into the Spirit at some point, you know, because you are faithful, because you pray a lot, you know, because somehow you have achieved a greater, you know, uh, 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 ability of spirituality you know and so there's this there there are these two tiers of christians the non-faithful ones and the faithful ones that have been baptized by the spirit and, and they speak in tongues but that's not what john is referring to john is referring to the reality that listen i'm preaching a baptism of repentance but one is coming who will give you a baptism of death and life. He will unite you to himself. And you will die and you will live. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the same thing that uh, Paul in Romans chapter 6 says, didn't you know that you have been baptized into Christ, into his death? And just as he resurrected from the grave, you have been baptized into his resurrection. That is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is when the Spirit of God falls upon a person and that person comes to life and is saved. And so only God saves. But not only only God saves, only God can sanctify. And, and John tells us, that not only is Jesus going to baptize you with the Spirit, but then he says that he will baptize you with fire. Once again, many charismatic brothers would say that is speaking of the tongues. Because tongues are fire, right? But if we only do a hermeneutical you know, kind of exercise and we just keep it to what Luke is saying we see that in the very next verse, Luke explains what the fire is. He explains what the fire is. He says, verse 17, his winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshold floor and gather the wheat into the barn, but the shaft he will burn with fire that never goes out. See, what he's saying is that the one who's greater than me, the one that me as a man, I, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes because he's God. That one, okay, he is going to come and he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And he is going to baptize you in fire. And what he's doing is he's, he, is, he is showing us, okay, that there are really two baptisms here. And some of the crowd that John is speaking to will be baptized by the Spirit. And some in the crowd that John is speaking to will be baptized into judgment. That's what fire is. And he gives us this illustration. He tells us that it's like, it's that the, it's like the farmer, right, who, who is peak, picking up the wheat. And... Um, I don't know anything about farming, and I really, I, I, I'd be lying to you if I tell you I know much about wheat. But shaft, right? 
shaft is like, it's like, okay, back in the days when I was in Nicaragua, we used to clean our beans before cooking them. And we used to clean our rice. You know, you guys, man, like, you, you never grew up in those environments. You guys have always gone to Publix and just picked up a bag of rice, right? And you cook it. But over there, you got, like, these huge bags of rice. And sometimes the rice had, like, a covering. And so you had to clean it up. You had to take that shaft off of the rice and, and put it aside. Well, that's what he's talking about. The wheat has a shaft, which is not good. It's not, it's, not, it's not good for food, right? And so what normally they would do is they would put the wheat on this, on this like, huge thing, and then they would throw it up in the air. And as they threw it up in the air and the wind caught the, the wheat, the wheat would fall down because it's heavier, and that shaft would be blown away. And what he's saying here is the same thing that Jesus later on explains about uh, the parable of the wheat and the tares, right? And how God will come and he will separate his people. He will sanctify his people. He will separate them and he will separate those that are not his. And they will go into the lake of fire. That's the same thing John the Baptist is saying. One is coming who is greater than I am. He is God. Okay, and what he's going to do is he's going to baptize people by either the spirit or by fire. My brothers and sisters, only God can save and only God can, satis can, can sanctify. And so that gives us the assurance that we need, right? We can be sure of our salvation. We can... We can uh, uh, um, be assured, we, we can be confident because he will save us. He will sanctify his people. He will set us apart and he will sustain us to the end because he will put us in his barns and we will not be lost. But the second reason, second point here, you know, of, you know, how we can find Jesus to be sufficient it's not just because he's God, but he is fully man. So Jesus is sufficient for us as salvation before a holy God. Why? Because he's fully God. But not only is he fully God, able to baptize us in the spirit, give us salvation, and able to judge uh, 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 the, the wicked. He's not only God able to do that, but he is also man, fully man. Verse 21 says, when all the people were baptized, Jesus also was baptized. Now, I love this because this is the shortest baptism narrative there is in all the Gospels. The shortest one. And I always like to stick with the text. That is something that was taught to me early on when I was learning how to preach. Is stick to the text because each author has an intent. And so I could easily go to Matthew and look at the, at the baptism there and see how, how Matthew gives us a conversation between Jesus and John the Baptist. And they go back and forth. Like, why are you here? You're supposed to baptize me. No, you baptize me. And they're going back and forth. But that's not what Luke gives us. So let's stick with Luke, right? And what Luke gives us is he simply says that when all the people were baptized... And the, and the beautiful part about this is he says it after, after he chronologically messes up intentionally and puts John the Baptist being imprisoned by Herod. And so he, he's making a point. And the point is that here at this baptism, something is happening. There, there is an ending of the ministry of John and there is a beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Right? There, there's a transition. There is a baton that is being passed from one to the other. And, and he tells us that Jesus come just as everybody else had come. And Jesus comes to be baptized. Now, I just want you to think about this, beloved. Jesus, sinless, perfect, comes with all the vipers. I 
I want you to think about that. I want you to think of all the sins that you have committed. All the sins that you struggle with even now. Your sin patterns. Your weaknesses. Man, those sins that men sometimes you just hate. And you hear of John calling people to repentance. And here you are with your sins. And you are walking towards the Jordan River to be baptized. Because, man, you, you feel the weight of your sin. And you want to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And as you're walking there, you look right next to you. And guess who's there? Sinless, perfect Jesus. That's just an amazing picture for me. That Jesus identified with the crowd. Not because there was any sin in him. But simply because he came to obey every word that came out of the Father's mouth. And who called John to call people to repentance? Wasn't it the Father? Remember last week when Pastor Jonathan said that John received word from God to call people to repent? And Jesus did exactly what the Father called people to do. Not because he had any sin that he needed to repent of, but because he was obedient to the Father. And so my brothers and sisters, he is fully man. He identifies with us. He's not just God and says, oh, no, man, let, yeah, come on, go, go get baptized with John. Come on, Christina, go get baptized with John. Go, go. No. He walks with us. And he goes into the dirty river waters of the Jordan. Not to be purified himself, but to purify us. He is fully man. And this is why, John, uh, uh, this is why Luke does this, this uh, genealogy right after this. Right In verse 23, he says, as he began his ministry, Jesus was about 30 years old and was thought to be the son of Joseph. And then the son of, I'm not going to say those names. All right? You're going to laugh at me. But look at verse 38, the last one. Son of Adam. Son of God. You see that? See what Luke is trying to do? He wants us to know that Jesus is fully man. He wants us to know that Jesus is the promised Messiah. He, he is the seed of the woman, right, who will defeat the serpents. He, he is the one. Fully man identifies with us. He's not ashamed of us. He doesn't get away from us, but he jumps right in with us. My brothers and sisters, number one, he is our representative. He is our representative. He enters the water representing us. He, he is baptized to obey God the Father. He, listen, he is obeying in our place. This is what Gresham Machen talked about when he was dying and he sent that telegram to his, to his colleagues. And he said, I am grateful for the perfect active obedience of Jesus Christ. This is it right here. Jesus is actively obeying the Father because he represents us. And he's coming to get baptized by John. But he's not only a representative, he is also our redeemer. My brothers and sisters, it tells us here that as he walked into the waters and as he gets baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him in a physical appearance like a dove. Listen to me. Why can, why can we find Jesus to be sufficient? 
Why can we be assured that no matter where we're at, we can walk to the Father. We, we can enter his throne room and we can, man, we can come and say, Father, please deal. Help me deal with these situations. Help me deal with these hard issues. Why can we find Jesus to be su sufficient? You know why? Because at his baptism, at his baptism, the Trinity appeared. We have God the Son in the water. And we have the Holy Spirit in the presence of a dove coming down on him. And we have the heavens open. And God the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus came, okay, and he was one of us. Like us, he needed the Spirit of God to empower him. Like us, when we believe in Jesus and we receive the Holy Spirit, right, he received the Spirit. Like us, you know, when we are dressed in Jesus, he received the, the, the commendation of the Father, we receive the commendation of the Father. He is our Redeemer. Let me just quickly say, when it comes to baptism, brothers and sisters, um, we know that John's baptism was different than Jesus' baptism. And there's many reasons. If we ask the question, why did he get baptized? I mean, there's so many different reasons we could give. But what I can tell you is this. Both, both baptisms give us a shadow of what Jesus was going to do for us. When Jesus goes into the water, it gives us a shadow that he would go into the grave for us. When Jesus comes out of the water, it gives us a shadow that Jesus was going to resurrect for us. And so, brothers and sisters, he is our redeemer. And lastly, he is our righteousness. He's our righteousness. Do you know that when Jesus looks at you, Sonia, I mean, when the Father looks at you, sorry, he speaks the same words that he's speaking here. This is my beloved's daughter in whom I am well pleased. Owen, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You know why? Because of Jesus' active, perfect obedience credited to our account by faith. The Father looks at you, Jesse, and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He is our righteousness. And so, brothers and sisters, we can repent. We can repent of sin. We don't have to hide it. We, we don't have to nurture it. You know, we, we don't have to lie about it. We don't have to blame our spouse. No, because if she didn't do this, then I wouldn't do this. We don't have to do any of that with our sin, guys. Because we have the perfect obedience of Jesus in our account by faith, we can actually fight against sin. We can actually expose it. Talk to a brother or sister. Say, hey, man, man, I am, I am struggling with this. Here it is. Not I am struggling with how 
so-and-so is treating me. No, me. Like, I'm angry. I don't want to forgive her. I hate her. I want to kill her. Like, we can actually be real about that and expose it and fight it and bring it to the Lord and bring it to our Father. You know why? Because our Father is not ashamed of us. Our Father is saying, come, son, come, daughter. Like, I am pleased with you in Christ. Last week, Pastor Jonathan called us to repentance, church. And this week, we see why Jesus is sufficient for us to do so. Let's put sin to death. But let's do it by running to our Father. And so today, we don't have communion. But as we sing before we leave, I want to give us an opportunity to run to the Father. The same Father that looked down at His Son Jesus and was pleased with Him. It's the same Father that looks at us and He sees us dressed in the righteousness of Jesus. So can we run to Him? Can we be real? Can we just expose things to Him? I'm not going to make you pray with anyone, even though there will be people here that you can pray with. Lewis and Susie are here. I'm here. My wife is here. Pastor Jonathan is here. Uh, Pastor Jose uh, and Odie are here. I mean, there's people here that you can pray with. But as we sing, will you just like, will you just like there, right there, will, will you just run to your Father and know that Jesus is sufficient? You don't need to run away. You can run to him. Right now. Right now. Right now. Let's stand up, church. Father, we, we run to you. Lord, we thank you that in the baptism of Jesus, we are witnesses of everything you have for us. Oh, you have the blessing of the Trinity over our lives. Oh, Lord. Lord, you have union with Christ, adoption as your children. Lord, you have the commendation of us hearing your voice say to us, you are my son, you are my daughter. And so, Lord, help all my brothers and sisters here today. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and help us run to the Father. Help us run to the Father, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, church, this is just